Good morning, Calvary. I'm Joe Pitleski, the pastor of evangelism. So delighted that you're here with us to worship in spirit and in truth this morning. Uh, even more excited, I think, that this is our first week we're gonna be able to come together physically live. So that's that's a blessing. Yeah, we've been, we're so thankful that uh, this weekend has come. I know many of us have been praying for it and are excited to worship together uh, physically again. But for those who are tuning in online, we are thankful to be able to worship with you uh, via online as well. And so we're glad that you're tuning in. We're excited for this morning because we're continuing our series, our sermon series. And uh, Pastor Keith will be preaching his sermon entitled, What Does Jesus Believe About the Bible? And so uh, we're excited to hear from God's word and to worship through song and in our giving. But before we do that, we just wanna let you know about a few things. Hey, coming up this next weekend, which is 4th of July weekend, we wanna let you know that we are going to be moving the Saturday night service to Thursday night so that people can celebrate uh, with their families and just spend that time together. We wanna to encourage you to be looking for communications from the church about that Thursday night service and how to RSVP for that, along with the services on Sunday morning as well. So please be looking for that. Also, we wanna let you know that coming up on July 5th, Kingdom Zone will be putting on an Independence Day parade. And everyone is invited to that. Kingdom Zone families, if you'd like to participate in that, we'd encourage you to look for the email from Kingdom Zone. Also, you can check it out on the Facebook page uh, for Kingdom Zone as well. We hope that you will be in attendance for that and join us. Well, every week we've been wanting to give you an encouraging story specifically related to our building expansion project. And this week, I wanted to share with you the fact that God has been providing for all of our every need on this project. And we've been looking for restaurant equipment and kitchen equipment. We found three pieces this week that normally would have cost the church $40,000, but we saved over 30,000 and got these three pieces this week for $7,000 total. So God has been faithful to us every step of the way. We're excited to share that with you this week. Well, Calvary, as you know, Pastor Eric has been introducing summer small groups to us the last few weeks. And so this week, you're gonna have a chance to sign up for those uh, online uh, on our weekly email. You should have already received that. So please go ahead and check that one more time and sign up for those. If you've been feeling disconnected or isolated in these past months, this is a great opportunity for you to get plugged in here at the church. Yeah, and another way to connect is through serving at the church. And so we wanna let you know that we are, we are in need of people to serve uh, during our services over the weekend. And these are on Saturday night and Sunday morning. There are all sorts of roles available, greeters, ushers, um, help with the cleaning team. Uh, please consider, prayerfully consider being a part of what God is doing as we, get, as we begin to gather again. If you'd like to serve and be a part, we wanna encourage you to email the church office at office at cbcnina.org and let us know of your interest. We appreciate you thinking about doing that. And those are our announcements for the week. So let's now quiet our hearts before God, ask him to come in to, uh, pr to be present with us and let's go worship together now. Good morning, church. Wherever you are, I just wanna invite you to sing with us and worship to our God and our Savior, Jesus. Sing, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love, too vast and astounding to tell. Forever existing in worlds above, now offered and given to all. Oh, fountain of beauty eternal, the Father, the Spirit, the Son, sufficient and endlessly generous, magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. Creation is brimming with thankfulness, the mountains exultant they stand. The seasons rejoice in your faithfulness, all life is sustained by your hand. You crown every meadow with color, you paint every shade in the sky. Each day the dawn wakes as an encore of 
magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how great, how sure His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. that you entered our brokenness you came in the fullness of time how far we had fallen from righteousness but not from the mercies of Christ your cross is the door to redemption your death is the fullness of life that day Forgiveness flowed as a flood. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. How great, how sure His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless love. us to infinite heights could anything sever or take us from magnificent marvelous matchless love how great how sure his love endures forevermore magnificent Love, oh, how great, how sure His love endures forevermore. Magnificent, marvelous, matchless morning church thanks so much for joining us for our online service we are so glad that you are tuning in it is good to be worshiping with you in spirit this morning and uh, we pray that it is a blessing to you as you continue to seek after the Lord through Jesus Christ and so we are happy that you are joining us my name is Ross Martin I'm the director of worship ministries here at Calvary alongside me is Kristen Doyle and David Neme as they help me in leading our, uh, you in worship to our Lord through song and so we are excited to do that if, uh, if you're not familiar with Calvary or you're tuning in for the first time, we want to let you know about our app. Please download that from the, any app store by just searching Calvary Bible Church Nina. You're going to have a lot of uh, ways to connect inside that app. So we just want to encourage you to do that. And we pray that that's a blessing to you as well. Well, as we, as we begin our worship this morning, I'm going to ask David Nimi to uh, open us with our call to worship and prayer. For our call to worship today, I'm going to read from Psalm Chapter 19, verses 7 through 11. It says, The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Lord, we are thankful to be in your presence this morning. Lord, we're gathered for your honor and your glory. We pray that as we worship you, that you alone would be magnified. 
you alone would be lifted up. Lord, we thank you that you are a holy, perfect God. We thank you that your, that your law is perfect. And we, we realize that in and of ourselves, there's nothing that we can do to keep that law. And so we, we, we rely on you, we lean on you, and on your grace and your mercy to us. Lord, it's nothing within us. It's all the power of Christ through us uh, that saves. And so we, we, we give you glory and honor for that. We pray that you'd be lifted high this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. As we think about that truth, that the law of the Lord is perfect, and it exposes who we are as a sinful man. For it's impossible, as David just prayed, as we just read, it's impossible for us to hold to that law perfectly. And James, it says, if, if we offend in one point the law, we're guilty of all of it. And so no, no man can hold to the law, but there was one, and that's Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to fulfill the law, to complete it. And because of that, was a worthy sacrifice for our sins and for our salvation. And so we are so thankful that it is not in us, that it is only through Jesus Christ that we are saved and his work on the cross. And as he has saved us, we are dressed in his righteousness and forever clean because of his work. We're gonna sing this song called Not In Me. We just ask that you just think about these words as we sing them. No list of sins I have not done. No list of virtues I pursue. No list of those I am not like can earn myself a place with you oh god be merciful to me i am a sinner through and through my only hope of righteousness is not in me but only truth can justify a single wrong. My righteousness is Jesus' life, and my debt was paid by Jesus' death, and my weary load was borne by Him, and He alone.
merciful through Christ alone. My righteousness is Jesus' life. My debt was paid by Jesus' death. My weary load was born by Him, and He alone can give me rest. Yes, He alone can give me rest. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we have just heard about how your law and how your word is pure and right and true. And we have just sung about how your righteousness has given us life. And we now ask for a heart like David's as he prays, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I might keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise that you may be feared. Turn away the reproach that I dread, for your rules are good. Behold, I long for your precepts. In your righteousness, give me life. That is our prayer. And now as we transition, as we worship through our giving, and as we hear the preaching of your word, we pray that we would continually remind ourselves of the righteousness that you have given us. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Just a few reminders uh, for you to be able to uh, give this morning as an act of worship. You can give uh, using our church app or our website. You can also text the word give uh, to the number that is shown uh, on the screen. You can also mail in a cash or check to the P.O. Box. That's P.O. Box 799 in Nina, Wisconsin. For our scripture reading this morning, we are in Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. It reads, this is Jesus speaking. He says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. It's good to see you uh, this morning and so glad to be in a time of worship uh, together. Uh, my family and I have been here uh, in town for just a little over three weeks, and I just wanted to express my thanks uh, to the Calvary Bible family for the warm welcome uh, that you've given to us. So many of you have sent notes and cards, and uh, we just feel so thankful uh, to be with you and to be here. Uh, so thank you for your kindness uh, to us. So we're back in the scriptures today as Michael uh, read it for us. We're continuing our series, New Kingdom Living, and our subtitle is Jesus, Life in Ours. And last week, we looked at a, a passage of scripture that really shows us as kingdom people how we are to live in the world. If you'll recall, we specifically saw three things. We saw that Jesus said that he would leave his disciples in the world, that he would uh, rise from the dead, that he would ascend to glory, that he would be seated at his father's right side, but that he would leave the disciples here. The second thing Jesus said that not only were the disciples to be left here, 
but that they would not to be of the world. They would be distinct from the world. If you remember, we looked at that salt imagery last week where Jesus said that his people were to be influencers in the world. And then third, we saw that the people of God, kingdom people, were not only to be in the world, to be distinct from the world, but were also to go to the world. We are to be the light of the world. And so we summarized it this way. We said that kingdom people are the salt to a world in decay, and kingdom people are a light to a world in darkness. And we now today come to verse 17 through 20 of this passage of scripture, and it's an absolutely critical text. And there's some things I wanna show you today. So if you don't have your Bible out yet, I encourage you to open up to Matthew chapter five, verse 17 through 20. And if you don't have a Bible, maybe pull up your phone and, and, uh, or open an app and follow along with us. Many years ago, in a faraway land, uh, there were a, a small village and they, the people had crowded into a large church. And it was, it was nighttime and there was a man named Jonathan who was lying on the floor with his arms outstretched in front of him before a cross. It was a very, very important night for Jonathan. He was about to become a priest. Uh, A bishop stood over him and was praying for him. And at the end of the ceremony, the bishop gave to Jonathan some special clothes. He gave him a blue robe and he gave him a white lace sash around his waist. Jonathan then received an invitation to go to the castle of a king, and he was supposed to go there to preach his first sermon and pass the test to become a priest. The day that he was heading to the castle though, it began to rain very hard, and as he rode his horse, the horse slipped and he fell into a pool of mud. Mud was everywhere. It was on his clothes and everything. And he thought to himself, he tried to brush himself off, but he he thought to himself, well, the the king will just have to understand what, what happened. And so he walked towards the castle. He tried to find a place to clean himself off, to make himself presentable. And then he entered the courtroom of the king. And people saw him coming. They sort of snickered and jeered and whispered to themselves, laughing quietly. The king was surprised as Jonathan entered to see his clothes. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't quite sure what was going on. And then Jonathan started speaking. Malice was a court magician who shouted out from the side of uh, the king's courtroom, wait, you can't come before the king in those dirty clothes? Malice didn't like any priests. Everyone turned and listened as the king. Now, what will the king do? He said this, Jonathan, why did you come here with such dirty clothes? You can't preach here with those dirty clothes on. And Jonathan tried to explain what had happened with his horse and the rain and the mud and all that stuff, but his words and his excuses just seemed kind of empty and feeble in the presence of such a strong king. Well, I'll tell you what, Jonathan, I'll give you another chance, but only if you can come back wearing clean clothes. And so Jonathan had to, in an embarrassing way, leave the king's court. He raced home. And the first thing he did when he got there is he tried to remove the stains from his clothes, but they just wouldn't come out. And so he thought, I know what I'll do. I'll go back to the bishop and I'll ask him for a new coat. And the bishop said to him, Jonathan, I'm sorry. I only give out one set of clothes to a priest. Jonathan walked away, devastated. He had no way to clean his own clothes. This story, which is an allegory written by R.C. Sproul, introduces to us the idea 
of the biblical concept of perfect righteousness, cleanness. The king in our story required absolute perfection in his presence. And this was pictured in Jonathan's clothes. But once Jonathan's garments were spoiled, became dirty, he didn't have any way of cleaning them himself. And this allegorizes for us the condition that Scripture describes of the human condition. Here's a few things the Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that God is a holy, righteous, glorious God in all of his perfections. And he is completely untainted by sin. And this contrasts, of course, with this sinful condition before a holy God. The scripture also tells us that God's righteous standard of perfection has been written down in a book. God's law, God's truth demands absolute perfection. Without which, like in our story, we cannot come into the presence of God in our sinful state. And the scripture also tells us that God's law, God's truth itself is holy and perfect, and that it is a purifying and powerful agent in changing people's lives. So when Jesus said the words that Michael read for us in verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees of the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The people who heard that message, the disciples and the crowd that were there, would have been devastated by that truth. They would have thought to themselves, who can possibly have a righteousness that is better than the scribes and experts of the law? Which raises a question for us today and raises a question for us in our series. And it's this, how do you and I, how do kingdom people become righteous? That's the question we're gonna try and answer today, and it's the question that I think this text of scripture answers. Uh, Perhaps another way you could ask that question is, how do you and I become good enough for God? So as we think about that, let's just put that in context. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is laying out for us the principles of his kingdom. We called them the Beatitudes, and I know that a lot of you Memorize those eight Beatitudes. In chapter 5, verse 17 through 20, Jesus, this passage is going to introduce for us six negative examples, we're going to, which we're going to look at over the next four or five weeks. But they also explain to us how we are to be living out as the people of God, the Beatitudes, and this is how we live out being salt and light in the world. We're going to see that Jesus sets up contrasts here. He's going to set up the contrast of a perfect righteousness that God's law, the Bible, demands of all people. And it's why Jesus said in verse 17 of our text, if you look with me, don't think I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to abolish, but to fulfill. And here's the reason. The reason is because God is holy. He's perfect in his nature. God is righteous and unchanging in his character. Scripture actually says that the foundations of God's throne are righteousness and truth and justice. So there's a perfect righteousness, there's an absolute perfect righteousness that is acceptable to God. And Jesus was going to explore now, in the next section of the Sermon on the Mount, the shortcomings of human efforts to keep to that standard of righteousness. And he's gonna develop for us the necessity of God's perfect righteousness. But kingdom people, if we will enter the kingdom of heaven as the first and last beatitude taught us, we need to understand what God's holy law demands of us. And the problem and the remedy are both given to us in scripture. So I'm gonna answer the question now. How do kingdom people become righteous? The first answer to that, we see in verse 17 through 19, is the kingdom people embrace the force of God's law. Let me say that again. Kingdom people embrace the force of God's law. 
Now, verse 20 functions somewhat like a thesis statement for the entire sermon. Jesus, again, is setting up a series of contrasts. But if you remember that fourth beatitude, if you go back to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6 with me and just look there, when we talked about the arch stone, the keystone, and I told you back then that it was a major theme in the Sermon on the Mount, this issue of righteousness and how righteousness is attained. But those, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Really, themes with verse 20 of our text, if you put those two thoughts together, what essentially Jesus is saying is, there is a righteousness that needs to be pursued. But what Jesus is going to say now in our text is that righteousness to be pursued is not a righteousness of human effort. It is a righteousness that is alien to the human experience. Specifically, it's the righteousness of Christ. Jesus is going to tell us that the righteousness that exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees is the righteousness that he provides to his people. Now I said Jesus sets up a contrast and what he's contrasting against is the laws, the extra laws of the scribes and the Pharisees. These were the perpetrators in Jesus' day of human righteousness. We told you a few weeks ago that the scribes and Pharisees had set up over 600 of their own rules that they added onto God's law. And it's hard for us to understand in this day how much power and influence the scribes and Pharisees had over the people. And Jesus is exposing them and he's exposing all of the extra rules that they were putting on people. So here's a question. How, how did the, what was it about the scribes and Pharisees' view of God's law that was different from Jesus? Maybe another way we could ask that question is, what did Jesus believe about the Bible? Verse 17, 18, and 19 actually answer that question for us. And I see three things in this text. I'd like to just walk through them quickly with you. First at ver, on verse 17. It seems to me from verse 17 that Jesus believed that the scriptures pointed to him. Um, Jesus introduces us here to, in verse 17 to a very high view of the scriptures. He didn't come to abolish, abolish it, he says. In fact, he promised the disciples in John chapter 16. He said, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and he will declare it to you. Jesus is telling the disciples, he's forecasting to them that the scriptures are about him. He came to, in, his first coming was in fulfillment of the scriptures. But here's the issue. Jesus spoke in such a striking and strange way to his audience that in John chapter 7 verse 46 it says, no one ever spoke like him. So some present might have thought, well, Jesus is making a break with the Old Testament law. Jesus is throwing it away and it's all gonna become new. Not so. Um, this passage, of, this verse here, abolish, uh, means to destroy or disintegrate. Jesus is saying, I didn't come to destroy and disintegrate God's law. I came to fulfill it, not to dismantle it. James Montgomery Boyce said it this way. He says the Bible is a book about Jesus. He fulfills the moral law of obedience. All the prophecies and the ultimate lamb of the sacrificial system with a once for all sacrifice of himself. Here's the summary. Jesus came to complete what had previously been given in bits and pieces throughout the Old Testament. Jesus harmonizes it and brings it all together and he perfectly fulfills the law. D.A. Carson said Jesus came to fulfill the entire Old Testament in a rich diversity of ways. It all finds its outworking in Jesus. So Jesus believed, first of all in verse 17, that the scriptures, the law, pointed to him. Secondly, in verse 17 and 18, Jesus believed the Bible was perfect in every detail. Jesus had a promise fulfillment view of the scriptures. 
Jesus didn't have a promise abolishment view of the scriptures. He says in verse 18, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota or dot will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Jesus is speaking here with a note of personal authority. Here's what he's saying. The the very smallest letter or jot, the iota, is a reference to a Hebrew Hebrew letter, yod, which is the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet. It's kind of like an apostrophe in English. What's Jesus' point? Every single small detail matters. God cares about the details. God's law, Jesus says, is not going to pass away. It is going to be fulfilled in all of its various details. Jesus believed that the Bible was perfect in every detail. Jesus believed that the scriptures pointed to him. But there's a third thing that Jesus believed about the scriptures in verse 19. I don't have to tell you that we're living in a day when people want to normalize the Bible. Just, it's just a book like any other book. And a completely true and trustworthy Bible should be treated with the utmost care. In verse 18, Jesus told us that this truth, this word, will never pass away. And in verse 19, in 18, it says that the authority of Scripture applies to the smallest details of Scripture. And then Jesus gives a warning. Whoever relaxes even one of the least of these commandments, whoever relaxes it or tries to get others agree with a different view of the scriptures, one that is filled with errors, Jesus kind of gives a double warning here. Uh, The double warning is to those who would want to change or subvert the meaning of holy, perfect scripture. The other is those who want to try and teach others to do that. But kingdom people today, in scripture, know this, everything matters. God is very, very precise. He's very, very precise in creation, we know that. And he's very precise in the communication of his word. And you and I, as kingdom people, are not to be casual or flippant or to disregard the Bible as just another opinion, to go alongside other opinions. This Calvary family is God's holy, righteous word because it contains knowledge of the most high God and his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and it contains in it the words of eternal life. And it all matters, every part, And God's word has the final word. It is the final authority of faith and practice. Friends today, this will be tested. Modern ears don't like the challenges of this old time-tested book. But kingdom people cherish God's word, care about the details, teach it accurately, and then seek to live it out practically in their lives. This is why David said in Psalm 119, oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. So the Bible for kingdom people functions like the rails for a train. It provides for us the tracks that guide kingdom living. We are to trust his word. We as kingdom people are to soak in his word. We're to pursue Christ and his righteousness as Matthew 6. And then all of these other things will be added onto us. And we're to be dependent on the Holy Spirit's power to come to accurate interpretations of Scripture as the Word of God fuels our obedience and our love. So what did Jesus believe about the Bible? He believed that the Scriptures pointed to him, verse 17, He believed that the Bible was perfect in every detail, and he believed that the Bible was to be obeyed and taught. 
And so we've seen that kingdom people, their relationship to the word of God is that kingdom people embrace the force of God's law. But there's a second point here in verse 20 that I just want us to see as I close today. Kingdom people also experience the freedom of God's grace. Kingdom people experience the freedom of God's grace. Verse 20 says, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Well, what does that mean? Well, the scribes and Pharisees, as I mentioned, were highly respected in Jesus' day. And the words of verse 20, as I mentioned, would take people's breath away. These guys were the experts. How is it possible for us to be better than the experts? They were given seats of honor at like banquets and stuff like that. And Jesus says that righteousness isn't good enough for heaven. It's not good enough for God. Even with, they had 248 different regulations, 365 prohibitions, but it was all external. It was all outward. Jesus says there's a righteousness that God demands that has to exceed that. Friend, True kingdom righteousness, what Jesus is saying, is not skin deep. It goes to the heart. It's internal. This is what Jesus means. It's internal and it is spiritual. It's not external and performance-based. True kingdom living seeks God, hungers for his righteousness. True kingdom living lives poor and needy and broken and desperate for God. Jesus is simply saying, you can't bring a righteousness to the table that is good enough for God. That's kind of the bad news. The good news of what Jesus is saying is this, is I can bring a righteousness that is good enough for God. Jesus' righteousness is a purity of the heart. It focuses on the spirit of the law, not the letter of the law. It focuses on internal matters of the heart, not external behaviors, which are law-driven. The Pharisees kept the rules outwardly, but they had rotten, unrepentant hearts. God sees through that. Jesus' kingdom comes to broken, repenting sinners. That's the starting point. And Jesus will change a man and woman from the inside out. My question to you today is, have you experienced the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus in your heart? Have you experienced a righteousness from the inside out? A righteousness that is not your own, a righteousness that is given as a gift of God's free grace. Jesus fulfilled the law for us he, in a substitutionary way, Jesus said, I came to fulfill it. How did Jesus fulfill it? Well, he kept it perfectly. Jesus obeyed the law in every part. In all of the ways we've disobeyed the law, Jesus kept his father's law perfectly. And second, Jesus fulfilled the law by dying on a cross. When Jesus died on the cross, it was actually the climatic fulfillment of keeping all of the law's requirements and demands. Only God could satisfy God's righteous judgments and demands. And Jesus fulfilled the law's demands for us as a substitute. John the Baptist put it this way. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So, as I close, the righteousness that God's law requires, that's the demand. The good news is there's a righteousness that Jesus provides as an act of free grace. So here's the deal, church. In Jesus, you don't just get heaven. By faith alone in Jesus, God grants to his people an incredible gift. He imputes to us, he gives to us the very perfection of his son. If we trust him, if we love him, if we follow him, he gives to us what we can't earn on our own. Let's go back to Jonathan for just a second in our story and see how this story ended. You remember that he had no way of getting his clothing cleaned to go into the king's presence. 
And as he turned to leave, the bishop said, you might want to try one more thing. What was that? You might want to go see the great prince. And so Jonathan followed the directions and he came to uh, the house of the prince. And as he entered, this great prince was very kind. He invited him to step forward. He'd never met anyone whose eyes were as kind as this prince's. And John, Jonathan said he felt compelled to tell the prince his entire sad story of his dirty clothes, of all that had happened with the horse and the mud and his desire to preach his message to the king. The prince listened with warmth and understanding. He said, follow, come over here, Jonathan, come see my fire. And one branch had fallen out and was no longer hot inside the fire. And as Jonathan picked it up, the stain of the soot was on his hand. He said, the prince said, Jonathan, you are like that branch. You're covered in black soot, in sin. And you don't just have dirty clothes, Jonathan. You have a dirty heart. So Jonathan said to him, well, what should I do? He said, here's what you do. I want you to go back to the palace and go and stand before the king and preach that sermon again, except this time, I'll be there to help you. And so he went, and as he came in with his dirty clothes, the people jeered at him for his dirty clothes, and malice was there again, accusing him that he wasn't worthy to be there. But then suddenly, as Jonathan stood up to preach, another figure appeared. He also had on dirty clothes, but he was carrying something under his arm. The stranger smiled and walked over to Jonathan. It was none other than the prince himself. But his clothes, his clothes were still dirty. The prince reached out his hand to Jonathan and gave him a beautiful, new, clean robe and said, put this on, Jonathan. Go and preach your sermon. The story pictures to us the gift of righteousness that God gives to his people by free grace. God's people experience the freedom of God's grace. But God's kingdom people, God's people also embrace the force of God's law. This is the righteousness that Jesus calls us to. This is Jesus' life in ours. Father God, I'm thankful for your word. Thankful, Lord, that the righteousness that God the Father demands, the perfection of your law that holds a standard of perfection over us, that weighs us down and makes us feel unworthy, is actually your kindness, Lord, to us, to show us our need for Christ and his righteousness. Lord, I pray that we will discover as kingdom people the blessing of hungering and thirsting after the righteousness that you give by free grace. But Lord, all of the righteousness of our own efforts that look so silly and foolish would fall away. And we'd come to realize there's nothing that we can do that can be righteous enough for God. And the beauty of the Christian gospel is that Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection gives to his people the perfect righteousness that does satisfy God. Lord, may we be captured with this truth again today as we live out new kingdom living together. In Jesus' name, amen. of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is 
is only Jesus For my life is wholly bound to His Oh, how strange and divine I can sing All is mine, yet not I But through Christ in me The night is dark, but I am not forsaken For by my side, the Savior, He will stay I labor on in weakness and rejoicing For in my need, His power is displayed shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley he will lead oh the night has been won and i shall overcome yet not i but through christ fate I dread I know I am forgiven the future sure the price it has been paid for Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon and he was raised to overthrow the grave to this I hold my sin been defeated Jesus now and ever is my plea oh the chains are released I can sing I am free and not I but through Christ in me With every breath, I long to follow Jesus For He has said that He will bring me home And day by day, I know He will renew me Until I stand with joy before the throne is only Jesus all the glory evermore to Him when the race is complete still my lips shall repeat yet not I but through Christ in me to this I hold my hope is only Christ in me, yet not I, but through Christ in me. Father, thank you for that truth. Thank you that our righteousness is in Jesus Christ alone. Thank you that he came to fulfill the law. Now as we go, may you receive the glory and the honor for this service, for our lives. And may we tell others of this great good news and the gospel through Jesus Christ. And we ask this in his name. Amen. Well, church, we want to thank you again for joining us in worship. 
We want to encourage you to stick around uh, tonight, 7 p.m., for the uh, live YouTube prayer time. And we just want to encourage you to join us in prayer uh, at that time. We also want to remind you that we're going to continue to send out uh, communication on our live services that are going to be going on. Uh, next week, we're only going to be having services on Thursday night and then two on Sunday morning. Uh, in lieu of uh, 4th of July. And so we want to encourage you to look for that communication and the RSVP uh, for those services that helps us to know how to spread out those services. And so we thank you for that. Well, God bless. Go in the grace and love of Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful week. We will see you next week. See you later, church.